What is hot in the world of children? To a special one-off episode of Chet and John's reassuringly finite gaming playlist. I guess it's still called that. Um, we've been talking to each other every day um, since the podcast ended because we've known each other for many, many years, and we just decided it'd be fun to um, to put a podcast together based on some of the games we've been playing this year. We kind of said when the podcast was uh, finishing that this might happen. That it was never going to be uh, a case where we never did anything again. Hmm. And it just seemed like the time is right. It's not going to be a regular thing, but I'm sure another one might crop up in the future. Just a quick note on the format. we uh, Somehow we managed to do 10 games a week during the podcast. In the months since the podcast, I don't think I've played 10 different games. <laughs> no. Certainly not 10 games worth talking about. So hmm. we're going to do a quick nod to the old format and run down a few uh, games we've been playing for reviews for different publications or, or just in our own time briefly and then um, do some slightly meatier stuff at the end and some of the games we want to talk about. So I guess, Chet, we might as well start with your number, whatever the hell it is. Uh, yeah, OK, let's do the five and then we'll do the, the biggies separately, I Wait. suppose. Um, OK, my number five is a game called J-Stars Victory VS Plus on the PlayStation 4. Have you heard of this? This is the game you showed me with all the, like... Bleach and all those guys having a fight, or maybe Naruto and One Piece. Yeah, it's it's a it's a brawler. It's like a kind of it doesn't look like Smash Brothers, but it's it's got the same sort of. Uh, okay. It, it's it's a three D run around in a three D environment fighting game. It's a really really crude brawler, um, and yeah. It has all those properties, One Piece, New Russo, Bleach, etc. Um, it's really simple, it's really loud, um, but it's just it's way too simple to entertain for very long. It's essentially all about the 50-50 choice between a very, very fast light attack and a slower guard break. Um, m- m- way too often, that's the crux of the fighting, is a choice between those two buttons. And <sighs> there are big, stupid combos, and there's destructible scenery. It's, it's basically what you'd expect from that game, but it's just... It gets old very fast. Um, it's it's just lazy, you know. Um, it's for it's for very young fans of those properties, yeah. I suppose, because it's so so simple. Um, the online is good. The netcode's stable for something so chaotic. But uh, there's a really rubbish adventure game tacked onto it where you're this little ship and you're just endlessly going around and getting into fights until you can't get past something without something. We have to go. It's just it's really lazy, really simple um, for completists only. I think. Mm. I wonder if kids still watch those programs because they were big when like my younger brother who's eight years younger than me was big into Dragon Ball Z and all that sort of stuff and they were on Cartoon Network then but they're not now those programs aren't on those channels now so I wonder if kids I mean I don't know who knows who could oh, ever know? You, you'd be best equipped to tell me what's 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 hot in the world of children, but, <laughs> 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 no, but uh, yeah, I don't. To be honest, I don't know. I mean, I assume I know that the, 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 these characters have been blended together in. It, this is a tie-in with a magazine, something Jump. Uh, Some, something Shonen, Shonen Jump. Shonen, Shonen Jump. Yeah, I've heard of yeah. that. Yeah, and that's still big, apparently. In okay. Japan, so, um, but I'm you know. There's yeah. always an audience for that stuff. It might be a small audience, but uh, over here as well. So I don't know. What, but the game is just it's, it's pure 5 out of 10. Oh, all right. Mm. Um, okay, my number, whatever the hell this next one I'm going to talk about, is uh, Tiki Taka Soccer on the phone. On, um, on the, uh, I was going to say iPhone, but I've not got an Android. iPhone. Right, the other one. Um, it's on iPhone as well. It's, um, it's quite a neat little um, handheld football game. It's um, similar to New Star Soccer in the way it controls, but you play it out like um, you, you play as a whole team as opposed to just playing as one player and it, it, mm. it, there's no commentary or anything. It plays in, in uh, real time. You, it, it's just got quite an elegant control system. It doesn't work perfectly, but um, you can kind of tap on the different players to pass it between them and then sort of swipe to shoot. Um, and yeah, it works quite well. You can actually put together some quite nice little passing movements, and it's uh, it's kind of like sensible world of soccer in that it's a management game as well. Very, very, very rudimentary management game. But you make up a team; they get stuck to the bottom of the equivalent of the vo- the Vauxhall Conference, whatever the hell it's called these days. Um, and you have to just try and get them up to the Premiership standard stuff uh, by players, um, add them to your team. Um, it's um, it's free to play, but the the microtransactions aren't too egregious at all. Um, not something that I'd say rush out and get necessarily, but one of the better 
uh, football games for that format, I'd say. It's, it's cool. It's it's English. I actually discovered it on the Rollmuck forum. I think uh, someone who posted it made it or made it in partnership with other people. So, um, yeah, it's decent. Okay, fair enough. What was it called? Tiki Taka Soccer. That is the name of the type of football that Spain used to play. You know, when they pass it around a lot in Barcelona, that really annoying type of football. Oh, someone come up with a name for that? Yeah, it's, it's a Spanish name, I guess. Okay. Uh, do you still play New Star Soccer? No, no, not since I moved to um, Android, really. I used to play on my old iPhone all the time. I kind of forgot it existed. But the way it's set up, it's like the way the phone's set up is a bit messier, so you just forget that you have apps on there. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right, well, my number well, my number four, whatever we want to call it, is, is a game called Infinity Runner. Have you heard of it? Uh, no, I'm going to say no. It's a first-person runner um, it's on Xbox One, PC, and PS4, and I, on the official website it says it's coming soon to Nintendo Wii, and I can only assume they mean Wii U. Um, but I, I absolutely hated this. <laughs> um, I gave it the lowest review score I've ever given anything um, because it just it actually offended me in the end. Because uh, it it it's, it's, it is a five minute long game that lasts for I think about three hours or so. Um, and repetitive does not even begin to explain it. There are animations and quick time prompts and seg- entire segments of levels that are just repeated and repeated and repeated. It's it's beyond shameless. It just just it just beyond shameless. Um, the, a, a best way of illustrating it is uh, to say that I think there are fourteen levels in the game, and on at least seven of those, at least seven, at least half of the of, of all of the levels in the game, I started playing and instantly thought, "Oh shit, I've, I've hit retry and I'm doing the level again. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing the level four. That literally happened that many times. Visually, it's unbelievably murky, and there are cutscenes and there is a plot. The game stops over and over again to deliver a nothing storyline, which completely ruins the experience because the conceit is that you're trying to escape from the world's largest spaceship and that's a, a decent conceit for a get for a runner so i thought okay that's a, not a bad idea uh, and the story just makes that less interesting um and then halfway through you start turning into a werewolf and when you're a werewolf the combat is taken care of for you so combat is just you whoosh run into a room and there's a load of guys there Y B A Y. And then again, and then you do it again, and then you run into another room and do it again. So when you're a werewolf, you don't have to do that. It just does it itself. And I don't know if being given less to do made the game worse or better. I really had a, I had a hard time trying to work out at, at which side of the coin was worse than the other. Uh, the music, the music is horrendous. <laughs> and there's, a, there's an achievement that's unlocked by playing the game on mute. Um, and as soon as you play it on mute, you realise how much better it is <laughs> without mm. sound. And there's there's some really piss takey achievements because whenever they popped up, it seemed to be taking the piss. I can't remember. I should have I should have written them down. Um, but I remember feeling like I was being trolled by the game. I think one of them was like waste waste of life or waste <laughs> of time. And I was sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just it's just trash. Um, and it's primarily because I suspect that the people who made it wanted to charge five pounds for it and not sixty nine p. So they just cut and pasted the whole thing on top of itself twenty times. The first five minutes, like, oh, okay, nice, you know, jump, slide, turn left, turn right. It's, it's a runner. It's a first person runner. It works. I've seen it all before. I've played games like this before, but fair enough, it works. And then the first five minutes are the game and then the remaining two hours and 55 minutes or whatever it was are just a vacuum that sucks every bit of enthusiasm (laughs) that I had for it Um, I felt aggrieved when I finished it it's three hours of fucking purgatory and it ends with a cliffhanger and the promise that there's going to be a sequel (laughs) so yeah don't call me you know what I mean (laughs) Uh, yeah I've got such a nap it's fucking Uh, crap yes (laughs) Um, All right. My, just, just forget about numbers. The next game I'm going to talk about is a game called Nero, which I played on Xbox One. I was asked to review this game. Um, this is, I believe, an, yeah, it is. It's an Italian game. Um, it's one of the uh, ID Xbox self published things. Oh, yeah. And this is one of those like first person walking games, like first person exploration, first person experience type games, you know, that would. Uh, Games like Dear Esther and, to an extent, Gone Home would, would kind of fall into this category. But this is a little more abstract, I'd say. Um, and it actually has a bit more gameplay in it in, in traditional sense because it has some puzzles. Uh, it's kind of difficult to describe. You, um, you're you moving through kind of unusual, almost dreamlike environments. Uh, that kind of makes it sound a little bit more interesting than it is. Um, trying to 
both uncover a fairly simple story about a family uh, and a slightly grander story about sort of um, the nature, the nature of the universe and um, the sort of ancient civilization. But again, I'm over, I'm kind of overselling it. I think by by, by putting it like that, it's a game of uh, of decent ambition. Um, it looks okay. The art style is kind of cool. First, you're moving through these kind of dark caves that are illuminated by weird plants and stuff. And then later on, you kind of move outside and it becomes a bit uh, more normal. Then you're in a hospital. It's, it's like, it's a little bit scattershot. It's a little bit all over the place. But um, this kind of one, the, uh, the the kind of simpler narrative thread do, do, does kind of pull through, even though what you're looking at and what you're kind of experiencing, the puzzles you're putting together, doesn't really fit into it at all. Um it's always nice to play something that you can tell is a labour of love for the people that have made it. Um, but at the same time, it would be disingenuous for me to say it would be it was entirely successful just because it's not uh, pumped out of some sort of corporate um, focus tested machine. Yeah. Because it's you know quite simply it's it's, it's a game that has uh, you know its, its share of failures. But um, yeah, it's an admirable piece of work. I don't. It was a while ago that I played it now, so it, you know, it's not it's not stuck with me that much. Uh, and there was a, an issue towards the end where the final puzzle, all the puzzles in the game are so easy that they're barely puzzles. They're almost like stuff you have to do to get just to, to break up the the walking. And I didn't mind that because I get a bit bored when it's just walking. So you're thinking. Mm-hmm. What am I doing, really? But the the final puzzle was a complete disaster, and I ended up having to contact the developers, and then they said, I'll just get straight back to you. And then it was like three hours later, and I was like, I really need to, I wish I'd never contacted you. Anyway, um, I eventually got the stupid answer to the puzzle, which we could have never worked out, and then it was one second later, and I finished the game. So, um, yeah, that was a bit of a nightmare. I think they might have patched it, so it's, uh, it's less horrendous than it was. But all in all, it's yeah, all right, interesting, Admirable in its ambition, uh, I guess, narratively and artistically, although it's sort of very unambitious in terms of uh, systems and mechanics. Um, but, yeah, you know, it is a thing that exists, and you, you wouldn't want it to have not been made. I guess <laughs> probably the best thing that I can say about it. OK. Uh, I've not heard... I've never heard of that, literally never. I mean, normally you see those crop up on the dashboard of Xbox One. Um, is it an exclusive? I believe so, yeah. I don't know about PC, but I'm pretty sure it's not on PlayStation. What are they uh, What are they charging for it? I think it might be like 12 quid. <sighs> yeah, that's difficult. It sounds like the kind of thing I might... I might maybe chuck a fiver at. It wouldn't surprise me if it did appear on Thingy Xbox, at some point. Xbox Game yeah, World, yeah. yeah. Um, that's really weird that you said what you said because do you remember Numa Breath of Life? I spoke about it. Like, yeah, the, the, I remember yeah, the name anyway. Yeah, the, it's another Xbox idea Xbox game, the first person walk around the mm. game where you solve puzzles. That I had to contact the developers um, towards the end as well to help me solve a puzzle, and then <laughs> it's almost exactly the same thing happened, which is quite weird. Um, but yeah, uh, okay, all right. Well, my number whatever is a game called Kirby and the Rainbow Paintbrush, um, which is on the Nintendo Wii U. Have you played this? I've not actually. I wanted to hear if it was any good. Um, it, I don't really have a massive amount to say about it. It's, it is solidly good, but it's lacking in the sort of personality and invention that you normally tend to expect from Nintendo games. Um, I mean, Kirby has had a more checkered history than Mario, um, but this is a sequel to that phenomenally good uh, Nintendo DS game, mm. Rainbow. Was it Rainbow Curse? It's well, actually, Canvas I think, Curse. Canvas Curse. Yeah, Rainbow Curse is what this game was called in America. That's right. Um, that that was a, that was a tremendous game, and this just doesn't doesn't live up to that. Um, what's probably weirdest about this one, um, uh, Rainbow Paintbrush, is that it lifts so many things from other games. There's a level in it that's straight out of Donkey Kong Country with those moving barrels where you have to line them up and then fire oh, them yeah, at the right course, time. Yeah. Um, and there are quite a few levels where re- it, it, the way that you play them and the way they're designed really feel like a Sonic game. Um, and the, 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 uh, something that annoys me is the best system in the game isn't used anywhere near enough. When, when you, you can use the stylus to say, you know, cut off water from that's coming down from a waterfall, so Kirby can move underneath it, or you can draw like a a, a, a thread of paint and deflect enemy bullets in another direction. Those bits are superb, but they are just annoyingly scarce. Um, so. I mean, this is mostly an enjoyable but quite bland platformer. I did enjoy it, but coming after that DS game was it, it's definitely a disappointment. And I don't know why it was. It's not on 3DS. That's that's a really weird decision because mm. primarily the game looks so lush. 
I mean, really good looking on your television, um, and you just end up looking at the tablet because yeah. you have to be looking. You know, you have to be looking where the stylus is, and you have to touch things on the screen. So there's no point in looking at the TV. Just think, why isn't this on DS? Where you know, it doesn't it, it's not a natural home. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it turned up in some form on 3DS at some point. Anyway, but um, yeah, I mean, oh, it has got some fantastic boss battles. The boss battles are all meticulously designed, and there's a fantastic bit where it turns into a shooter briefly. Um, so it's. It's it's pretty damn good. I mean, it, it's not pretty damn good. It's good. It is good. I think it's perfect for kids that like can't see the steels mainly. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's good. It, it's just not great. All right, All right. Yeah, uh, my my little boy's been pestering me about that one, but he has something else yeah. to play at the moment. So. I, I well, I mean, I think I I think it's uh, yeah. I think that's who I'd recommend it for kids who wouldn't get up as here about things that it nicks. <laughs> yeah, I think you'd be alright about that. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about what he's playing at the moment um, later. Okay. My next game is uh, The Elder Scrolls Online, or The Poundland Skyrim, as I like <laughs> to call it. Uh, uh, so It's so boring that it's kind of hard to even talk about it. Um, it's an MMO. It's set in Tamriel, the world of The Elder Scrolls, and you don't like The Elder Scrolls, and I don't think you've ever really been able to get into it and that's completely fine but I'd imagine your experience of what the Elder Scrolls games are like is actually what this experience is and not what the the true experience that people enjoy the proper Elder Scrolls game in mm. In fact, uh, sorry not in fact because what this game is is just walking around doing the most mundane shit, doing really really uh, weak combat and interacting with characters with literally zero personality um it looks okay. It doesn't really have the kind of open world that you expect from one of these games. It's more sectioned off areas, which is a bit disappointing. But to be fair, later on, it, it does broaden out a bit. But, you know, what's wonderful about the proper Elder Scrolls games and, and Fallout 3 as well, and I'm sure Fallout 4 coming up, is they're, they're basically games of discovery. You know, they have their RPG, uh, RPG systems within them, but... They're, I can't really describe it. They're, they're games of discovery. You'll go and, and find something, and then that will lead to something else, and quests layer upon each other, and then you end up going somewhere you'd never expect and uncovering this whole side story. Um, this is literally a guy will ask you to do something, and you just go and do that, and it may layer on a couple of quests on top of that, but they're never interesting. And the weirdest thing of all is um, everybody's on there at the same time but the, you're, you're never interacting with them so you're constantly surrounded by other players you can talk to them and end up grouping up with them but really unless you're playing with people that you know are you really going to in 2015 go up to random people on a, on a video game and start striking up a conversation with them it's probably not going to happen so whereas in a game like Destiny you might end up teaming up with people in the patrol missions um, just briefly uh, while you do something and then go off on your way, you can't you can't really interact with them in the same way in this. So you just end up with all these other people playing the game on their own, uh, kind of existing in your world, but not really doing anything. And it's 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 actually really distracting. Quite often you can get to a quest and the enemies that you need to kill are already dead uh, because the guy in front of you just hacked them to pieces. And you're like, well, I, cheers, I guess. But <laughs> I've just walked over here. I might as well hit this rat. <laughs> um, or or they'll just. Just, you know, one of the other things that's great about a, a Skyrim or, or, or a Fallout is a kind of sense of isolation. And, you know, it, it goes hand in hand with a sense of discovery, but you really feel like you're 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 carving out your own story within this world. And, and you're constantly being reminded that there are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of other people doing it as well. At the same time, it, it does sap away uh, from that side of thing set side of things quite a lot. But at the same time, it's not an awful game. I can imagine people who... Perhaps people are slightly less demanding with their time <laughs> and people who just kind of enjoy levels going up and uh, loops and that kind of basic dopamine response, um, enjoying it. And it's, it's certainly not an awful game. Um, I just found it deathly boring. And that's probably one of the worst crimes any game can commit to me because um, yeah. it's, it's less about money and more about time these days just because you know, I don't have enough time to even spend a lot of money on video games so it's not even uh, about that but being asked to spend 20, 30, 40, 60, 100 hours on something that, that boring is um, yeah, it's a bit of an ask really um, It's none of it 
geared towards co-op? Are you not forced at any point to to have to find something? No, to you're not like forced that? to. You're not forced. To. Obviously, it's encouraged, and it's you know the idea is that you play with people, your friends, and you can just like I say, talk to any of these people that are pissing about around you. But yeah, you're not going to as much as you probably wouldn't in, in, in any other game like that. But it's there's less like. It's not like this quest requires this many people or anything like that. And certainly I didn't come across any of that. You can solo the whole thing, which is, I guess, is good because it's it's from a, a series of games that are single-player games. Mm. So, you know, originally. So I can't see why people want to do that. But it's just, it's, it, it, I can't, you might as well just erase everything I just said and say it's like a fucking pound shop Skyrim. And that's exactly what it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Has it sold? Um, I think it's done okay from what mm. I can work out. It's only a hit number one when it came out on consoles uh, a few weeks ago before uh, some of the bigger games hit in the last few weeks. Um, by all accounts, it's done okay. I mean, that, it's, a, it's a very strong brand for, for one of a slightly less ugly turn of phrase. So you're going to have fans that are going to be interested in it. But yeah, I, I'd imagine if you've played hundreds or plus hours of Skyrim and Oblivion to come to this, you'll be like, eh, oh, yeah, this isn't mm. what, this isn't really. It gives you a much greater appreciation of what is actually achieved in those other games. Okay. All right, fair enough. Well, I mean, it's like, it's never my bag anyway. No, of course but, not. Um, there you go. Uh, okay, uh, my next game is Project Cars on Xbox One. Oh, yeah, um, I've played this. I forgot. Yeah, you didn't play much of it, did you? Uh, no, no, just like an um, hour and a half. Yeah, I didn't review it, by the way. So, yeah. right. I'm not some um, terrible person. I I mean I liked Project Cars rather a lot, um, despite the fact that obviously it's not made for me. It's it's so serious, um, and I thought as soon as it started, I thought, oh god, because it starts with a montage and there's opera music, and I'm just like, oh for God's sake, I can't I can't deal with a game that takes another game that takes driving this seriously. Um, but when it started, I realised that you can start your career the career mode as a go kart racer, mm. and then you can work your way up to Formula One. And I thought, okay, cool. And that's what the best the best aspect of the game is that it is essentially seven games in one because each driving style is completely different. Um, but when it started, I thought, okay, cool. I'll start with go karts. How mm. serious, you know, how, how how dead serious can go karts be? They've got fucking gears on them. Shit. I googled it. I said, there's nowhere in the world where go karts have gears on them, is it? No, there isn't. There is, go karts do not have gears, but in Project Cars they have gears because this is a serious game about fucking driving. Um, but yeah, it, I, I just ended up really. I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for the amount of content that's there. Um, I mean, it's not visually very interesting, and it has no personality really. But I just, mm. I, I just, you have to admire it. Um, you just know that this is many, many people's game of the year. Um, and I was lucky in that I found a sweet spot control-wise because I know people have had nightmares trying to calibrate the controls. And if you go on, you know, there's a there's a page dedicated to it on Reddit, and people are just sharing these pages and pages of screenshots of what their settings are, everything tuned to, to, to one degree here and one degree there. I found the perfect one. It was the first one I tried and I think the one thing I, I think it's made for steering wheels, um, I, uh, more so than any driving game I've ever played. Because when you're holding the controller and you're using the controller to control, most driving games, even Forza, e- even serious driving games like Gran Turismo, you can kind of flick the thumbstick and you yeah. can be quite callous with it. Here, you have to kind of caress it, and it that just made the game more exciting because I was on the edge of my seat, like I was trying not to drop something, just just taking these corners just as perfectly as I possibly could, and I, I, that that worked. That it made the game really, really exciting. Mm. I realise that's a very, very specific uh, scenario uh, to me, but um, it, it, ma- it made the game um, as far as I'm concerned. And there's just there, there's uh, there's so much content, and it's yeah, like I said, it feels like seven games in one. I'm not a driving game enthusiast, but like I said, I had to admire it. I'm never going to play it again, no way. But uh, while I was playing, I did I did enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, I, I had some trouble with it. I did the go karts and. Um, quickly trying to progress on to, to proper cars, but then the, the the audio dropped, and then next time I turned it on, it crashed. So it was it was kind of a rough start for me. So I can't really give a, a proper opinion on it. it I thought um, it looked kind of cool, and it's one of those games where you kind of uh, people who know about cars and car games and um, these sorts of things are raving about it. So you kind of just sort of respect their knowledge and, and accept yeah. that it probably is what it is. And my opinion isn't really <laughs> of much worth. Although I now can drive, so now I know everything about cars. And so there, <laughs> there you go. Um, are you any more interested in cars than... A little bit, a little bit, yeah. Because our car that we have is, uh, well, let's just call it a family car and it's kind of old. So 
the idea of I think if I ever drive a nice car, like a really nice car, like uh, a Mercedes or something, that will be it. I'll be like, oh shit, I need to. I need to have this immediately because our car isn't much fun to drive. It's just like a, I just call it fat face. It's just got a big fat face. But um, yeah, driving's all right. I should have done it 15 years ago. But what can you do? What Can't can you do? Time. Yeah, true that. Okay, well, yeah, Project Cars, I mean, it, I, I would not recommend it to anyone who's sort of into casual racing games at, at all. It's really, really dead serious for people who are really, really, you know, they're into, yeah, their, yeah. you know, they're into finding the one degree that makes the steering kick back not you know you know what I mean? yeah. but, but i admired it anyway right uh next one for me is lego jurassic world which i've been playing this week ah. um yeah i mean what can i say this is a tough one to even talk about because uh it just is the mo- probably the most formulaic lego game there's been in a while but mm. um still really really well made um pretty funny and uh, and nice to play on my own or, or in cult with uh, with my little boy. Um, it's all four Jurassic films. Um, even though it says Jurassic World, you think it would just be the new one, which I haven't seen. But uh, you can start off doing the new movie or doing uh, the original movie. Um, both of which the production values are, is are really good. And uh, after that, you unlock the um, the middle two, uh, which the, you can see that they've put less emphasis on them, but they're still they're still good and there's still some good set pieces. But most of the time, you're just doing the standard Lego stuff of walking up to a thing. If it's the wrong character, they'll shrug. If it's the right character, you'll mm. carry out the action. Um, maybe you'll find some bouncing blocks, build a thing. Like, super simple. Um, I did appreciate it being slightly simpler than some of the recent ones just because when playing uh, with it, well, he only just turned four, um, my son, he the, the Lego Marvel, for example, is a bit of a headache because there's lots of little areas in that which... Uh, you'd need a character that you're not currently playing with to work yeah, there, like yeah. secrets and stuff like that and he can't really understand and it's very frustrating to try and play it with him as you're like left no the other left and oh it's just it's, it's a fucking headache uh, this was um uh, way less severe and he was actually able to do some of it on his own as well which he hadn't been able to do with those other ones but in turn that probably means if you're a adult playing on your own um, it's going to be less satisfying than, than some of the more complicated and ambitious Lego games of, uh, of, the, of the last few years. But, you know, I mean, Traveller's Tales know how to break down a classic movie, pick out the best scenes, and turn them into Lego comedy. They're, they're masters at it, really. And you can imagine all the, all the best scenes of uh, the first movie, for example. All the iconic scenes are there, uh, done really well. They do really clever stuff with death because obviously those films aren't really aimed at young kids mm. um but basically <laughs> any time there's a death in one of the movies they replace it with the dinosaur eating a sausage <laughs> 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 um and it's just a gag that pretty much works every single time yeah, yeah, that's cool. um yeah so it, it, it's i mean it's scary in a way that it's sort of a little bit tense for for a really young kid but it's not like gonna traumatize them or anything like that and um yeah, just just good solid stuff. Like it it has an open world, but it's not like um you know, the Lego Marvel one or the Lego Batman two one. It's not it's not really it's just something to kinda of mill around in mill around the island and stuff like that. It's uh, just a series of set pieces and puzzle sections over the four movies. Just that's of that quality level that you expect. Although one one bad thing about it is that they use um audio from the movies um they feed, feed that into the action which is cool because it means there's dialogue and you get some of the classic lines but the mix is really bad it's almost like they just ripped it using a phone or something and then just played it back really bad like the levels are all messed up some are really quiet some are really loud um you can pick out all the background noise that's happening at the same time it's um that's really rough actually it's surprisingly rough compared to the rest of the game and the rest of their production so not sure about that but yeah the rest of it's good um, I've, be, I, I've become so used to those games being brilliant that I'm quite surprised that I, I did wonder when the wheels were going to come off and it, they were going to start making. Well, I mean, that sounds like it's kind of formulaic, really. It's very formulaic, but it's fine. It's not. It, it's better than you know, better than average. Like it's still really quite good. Yeah, I mean, I, they don't make terrible games. No, you wouldn't. Those. You could play through the whole thing and have a good time the whole time, even as an adult. Like, you don't have to play cart with a kid or anything. Hmm. Uh, well, the thing about the product, about the, this audio quality, I, when they announced it and then the release date got announced, I did think that sounded like way too short of a period. I, I remember thinking that I, I couldn't believe that 
they did. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just because I'm so out of touch that I hear about things late. But I thought that they didn't have enough time to have it ready for when the film came out, and they did. So how that relates to the quality of the audio may just be nothing. But uh, there you go. So that's the first Lego game I haven't played um, in ages. So did you play Batman Three? Uh, I did. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, um, loved it. Uh, okay, all right. My next game is. A game called Magicka 2 on the PlayStation 4. Uh, it's also on PC. Have you heard about this this series? Yeah, kind of. Kind of. It just looks like one of those things that I don't. Yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. or like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same here. Um, but I was ta- I was kind of taken by surprise. It, it, I mean, it's a very very slight, but it's a, <clears throat> a very enjoyable co-op action game where you play as uh, one of three little wizards running around you know casting mm. spells and just generally kicking ass while also making sure that you aren't kicking your co-op partner's asses by accident oh, okay. as well because that's one aspect that really works in the game's favor because that it, 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 that doesn't really stop being funny it's so chaotic and it's so all over the place that it, it's it's so easy to not notice that you're completely screwing over your teammates while you're attacking something i mean i laughed quite a lot when i was playing this um and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very simple. There are no classes. There's no leveling systems. It looks like it should be like some kind of RPG, but it's actually a pretty blunt action game, and that uh, that, that was completely fine with me. Um, uh, I play, yeah, like I said, I played it on PS4, and the matchmaking is really brisk, um, and I had no issues online whatsoever. So there is a. Th- uh, a slickness about it that I, I really really liked you know there were certain levels I had to do I always found two people to do it with you know there was, seemed to be a, a really healthy community the only thing that's wrong with it I think um, and I, I, get, uh, I garnered this because I never played the original but apparently online people were saying that the spells are basically identical right. um, so if you learn the spell if you want more magic spells and you want to toy around with different you know not runes but uh, you know the the, 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 the the different types of magic to make other spells they're all exactly the same as they were in the in the first game which which I suppose would probably disappoint someone who's looking for uh, looking for um, something other than than just more of the same. Uh, but yeah, it, it's genuinely good fun. It's nothing new, and it's completely unplayable alone, which I thought was a bit snide. It's so difficult; it's it's essentially unplayable if you try and play it on your own. Um, but if you you know nab two mates, you'll have a very good time. If it ever appears on PS Plus, it will earn loads of fans really okay. quickly, I'm sure, because it's a, it's, a, it's a decent romp. Mm. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, mm. yeah, I do. Good. All right, my last of these uh, mini games, then mini reviews or whatever, um, is Yoshi's Woolly World on oh, yeah. Wii U. Now I've not actually been playing it that much myself. I have played um, a, sort of a, a decent amount, a couple of hours. It's mainly been uh, my boy. It was his birthday present, one of his birthday presents, and um, he absolutely uh, loves it. But um, some of the reviews have been a, a little harsh. So um, yeah, we're only on uh, I think the fourth world of the game. Um, he's obviously he takes it a bit slower because uh, it's actually reasonably challenging. It's more challenging than it seems. The first couple of levels are an absolute piece of piss, but uh, it does step up um, reasonably significantly. And it kind of is exactly what you'd expect it to be if you played any of the Yoshi games at all. The, the systems are the same: eating enemies, shitting them out, and then chucking the eggs <laughs> at other things. Um, and obviously, the graphics and the whole art style and everything about it is, is, is sumptuous. Quite frankly, it looks amazing. Um, it's really, really consistent. There's there's rarely a moment where they've not thought of some clever crafting thing. I mean, there's obviously that little big planet style to it, but they managed to. Uh, it's everything is about wool, really, and just even the stuff like uh, like the Cooper's little feet, just little loops and stuff. It's just it's stuff that doesn't necessarily matter in the grand scheme of things in terms of gameplay or systems, but um, mm. the, the the aesthetic's so consistent that that it really is quite impressive. And yeah, I, I, I've barely got a bad word to say about it, quite frankly. Um, yeah, some of those review scores they feel a little bit low, and it seems like everybody's always comparing it to Yoshi's Island, which is a uh, a very very old game now. I mean, it's like twenty years old or something. So um, fair enough. I mean, they're, they're, mm. they're, they play out this the same way with the same systems. But I like the three DS one, which people kind of uh, sl- sorry slated. Um, I like that a lot. I gave it an eight out of ten in the review for Games TM, and my, my boy loves it as well. Um, this is better than that, definitely. Mm. Uh, the ideas are better. The um, the execution's better. The music's not as good <laughs> because nothing will ever beat the music in the three DS Yoshi game. Um, nope. But yeah, uh, just just unbelievably charming, obviously, and just a really tight 
platformer. It's not the best 2D platformer on uh, Wii U because that is uh, Donkey Kong Country, um, Tropical Freeze. But uh, it's definitely up there with that new Super Mario Brothers. I'd probably prefer it to that. And um, he, yeah, he absolutely adores it. Just uh, nice ideas throughout, um, immaculate execution, uh, immaculate presentation, mm. and um, that Nintendo kind of that Nintendo charm. Charms are, it's such a it's a charms a bit of a wet word, really. That, that, that Nintendo, it's just kind of when Nintendo are like that. And I know this is technically good feel, whatever that means. It's not technically in house, but. When Nintendo's dealing with their properties like this, it, it is a cut above. Um, there are better games than this out there, but just the kind of level of polish and consistency is, is a cut above almost everything else. And you've got to remember, like Yoshi's Woolly World is a game for kids. That doesn't mean mm. that the adults shouldn't play it or adults shouldn't enjoy it, and it certainly does. The challenge does ratchet up. But it's it's kind of madness to think that they're just made for adults and um, you know they're, they're, they're kids' games, and this is uh, another like... Um, Mario 3D World, uh, another uh, immaculate, that's the word I've used like 90 times, it's another excellent, excellent game for, for kids. And um, mm. and it's co-op too, so you can play it with your, your young man and the co-op's really nice because you can munch each other and use each other as, as eggs. They're actually not eggs, they're, they're yarn balls. But um, yeah, great stuff, like, really great. I, I, was, um, I thought it was going to be worse than it is, and it's great. Okay. Does the wall is the gameplay about the wall? It, it is, yeah. I mean, you could probably substitute some wall for something else, and the systems would remain would like remain the same. But the, you know, there's like you look at you find little um, sort of ribbons, not ribbons, like the equivalent, like bow ties almost, sort of around the world, and you can grab them with your tongue and unravel stuff, and they'll uh, reveal secrets. Um, like some of the bosses that like you have to like unravel their clothes, and then they'll get angry and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, I mean, the wall ties into the gameplay more in a visual sense than in, a, like, you're creating stuff with yarn or anything like that. You're not really doing that. But, um, yeah, everything about it's just, it it, 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 you're ra- it raises a smile every minute. Hmm. And, yeah, you, you, what, what more can you ask for? Yeah, indeed. Um, well, I mean, the, the last, the, the epic yarn, that really the, that really infect, inflected the gameplay. And that's why uh, the, the Kirby game that I spoke about a minute ago, it's quite weird because everything in that's made out of clay and it looks amazing, but it's just made out of clay because it doesn't okay. have anything to do with the gameplay. And that was disappointing. So um, at least it has something. Uh, yeah, oh, it definitely oh, does. Oh, yeah, in that respect, it definitely, definitely does. Okay, fair, fair play. Okay, all right. Well, that was, that was the fives. Yeah, that took longer than I thought it would, but never mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was supposed to be, be, take five minutes. But uh, uh, okay, well, what, what do we do now? Okay, so I've got three games to talk about, and you've got two, but one of them's the same as yours. So I reckon what we should do is I'll introduce it, you do the, the most of it. I'll do my next game, you do your next game, and then I'll do my last game, and then we're done. Okay, I think I understood that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the first game, the game that we both played and that we both can talk about is Batman Arkham Knight. Um, I believe I've not played as much as Chet from what we talked about just before we started recording. Hmm. So um, I'll give a quick rundown of what the game is, if you don't know. It's the third, well, it's actually the, technically the fourth Batman Arkham game, but it's the third one from Rocksteady. Hmm. Uh, the guys who created uh, the Batman Arkham series in the first place, and before that, uh, Urban Chaos Riot Response, a game I still have in my drawer, weirdly. Uh, but, but anyway, that's not really the point. Um, it's it's Batman in, in a kind of expanded um, open world, expanded over uh, Arkham City, uh, the second game, but not on the scale of uh, a GTA or, or anything like that. Um, kind of doing what Batman does um, in these games, but with the the added bonus of having the Batmobile with him this time. Um, the game starts off with... Uh, actually, I'm not even going to spoil the end of Arkham City if you haven't played that. So, mm. um, From what I've played so far, the polish is of uh, a level, uh, astonishing level. I was talking about polish with, with Yoshi there. Um, I know there's massive problems with the PC version of this game, but I can't worry myself about those. That's kind of like a separate issue. It's, mm. you know, releasing broken games like that is awful, but... I bought the PS4 version, and despite apart from some issues with the leaderboards, which I believe they've already fixed, um, it's it's an amazing the level of polish and quality. Uh, you text me saying this is like pure pure AAA, and you can't really argue with that. It's uh, of a level that that's rare, say the least. I say rare, but I'm going to talk about three games which <laughs> are kind of like that. But um, yeah, I, it's difficult because I know you play a lot more than me, so I'm, you're going to have more to say. But I've been incredibly impressed by what I've played so far. I am. 
a huge fan of these games. I'm not like a Batman fanboy. I like the, the Nolan movies a lot, and I've always liked Batman um, as a character. But I'm not. I'm not someone who, who really worries himself too much about superheroes or, or comics. It's not really me. But these games have really kind of spoken to me. Um, Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, less so Origins, although I didn't mind it. And this is just feels. After a kind of start where it's perhaps overly familiar, you soon learn some new moves and new ideas start to come in. The Batmobile starts to come in more. I know people have some issues with that later on. I've enjoyed everything I've done with it so far. And then the story starts to kick in after that and um, does some really, really interesting uh, and exciting things. I won't spoil any of them, but um, for me, already shaping up to be another rock steady masterpiece and showing up the fact that Origins, um, although a decent game, just was not anywhere near this level. Yeah, um, no doubt about that. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, although I do have a, a few little issues with Arkham Knight, I just I do think it's the absolute definition of a must play video game um, for for all of its uh, flaws, and there are, there are a few. Um, it is just it's entertainment of an exorbitantly high quality, um, and it's in, inventive, and it's really glossy, and it's often crazily exciting. Some of the set pieces in it are just, and they, they're, they're streamlined. They've streamlined the side missions so everything's accessible via this radial sort of dial menu, mm. and you can you can basically change the pace of the game essentially if you like, because the main story is really set piece heavy. Even for this series, it's memorable action almost nonstop. Um, in terms of the way the game looks, it's just it's jaw dropping. No, in the, it really is breathtaking. Yep. Um, I know I've st- I've steered clear of everything. I haven't even seen a screenshot of this game. I haven't seen a trailer. I steered clear of everything. And I know if I'd have seen the game running a couple of months ago, I'd have said there is no way the finished game is going to look like that, and it would annoy the piss out of me. It looks yeah jaw dropping. Yeah. Um, my main problem with the game, and it's only it is only minor. It is the prevalence of the Batmobile. Mm. Um, the Batmobile just as a self-contained gameplay device is surprisingly low stakes and surprisingly old fashioned there are a couple of bits well there are a few bits where it's used quite inventively as a as like a tool for you to solve puzzles but aside from those it's just turkey shoots it's the kind of straightforward and risk-free turkey shoots that you see every year in call of duty they're not unenjoyable but i just think there are way too many of them i did wonder why there was so many of them in the in the main story um the way the story is told is occasionally very audacious and there are there are several surprises and actually quite a few jumps as well because of how one aspect of the story is handled i i was startled quite regularly which i wasn't expected i was also a little bit disappointed by how much it appeared to take from the Chris Nolan Batman films. I mean, I don't read the Batman comics. I'm sure there are elements to Batman that are explored just constantly. But the 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 main villain's evil scheme is taken directly from uh, Batman Begins, and some of the issues about how far Batman's going to go, you know, it's, it's straight out of the Dark Knight. I mean, Batman is very violent. Um, this this game actually earns its eighteen certificate. It's it, he's a lot more torture happy, and uh, yeah, it seems to be sort of asking some of the similar questions uh, that came up in the Dark Knight. But that was a little bit disappointing to me. It felt like it was retreading old ground, but. Uh, um, that might just be one of the things that's perpetually perpetually dealt with. Uh, but yeah, this is still just first-rate stuff. It should not be missed. Um, games like this do not come around very often, um, and I think they should be cherished. I mean, it's gripping and exciting and inventive, and yeah, I mean, it's about as good as games like this get. Uh, and Rocksteady are just like a- an absurdly talented bunch. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's, 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 I've, I've loved it. It grips me. Um, there's, there are some weird things in it, though. I mean, like, Batman's essentially killing loads of people. And, you know, you're shooting people, but there's there's always voices over the tunnel saying, oh, God, you should use... I'd use live rounds or something like that. You know, you're shooting people, but they're not dying. And the one weird thing that happens is when you're driving the Batmobile, and, you know, they establish at the beginning that the only people left in Gotham are criminals, so hitting them with your car is something you do all the time. But seemingly to try and reassure you that you're not running people over and killing them, the Batmobile seems to be electrified, so when you hit people, they get, they get run over and they get frazzled as well. So you're just like, that's got to be worse. I mean, like, if I just hit, <laughs> why hit them and electrocute them to death? Um, so so uh, yeah, that's odd. But yeah, I mean, I, the game's just tremendous, mm. tremendous. Yeah, I can't wait to get back into it. Um, the only reason I haven't is because I've been playing it at the same time as uh, another incredibly large game, uh, The Witcher Three: Wild Hunt. Oh yeah. Um, 
Which again, I mean, the reason that we wanted to do this podcast is because there really were some games worth talking about, and um, the time seemed right. And this is a, again a really quite incredible achievement, um, an, an enormous game, and one that I'd imagine is going to take me many months, uh, probably even you know until the silly season, towards the end of the year. I can imagine I'll be playing this. I'm not in any rush to get through it, but um, yeah, you know what it is. I mean. The Witcher 2 was kind of uh, a strong story-driven RPG with, with uh, intelligent systems that was played out and sectioned off small uh, open areas that, uh, that you kind of progress from one to the other. Whereas, as you probably know, The Witcher 3 is uh, is a vast open world. Um, it's kind of the, there are some little sectioned off bits as well, but and it really is uh, an enormous open world. Um, I'll start with a couple of tiny negatives. I don't think it's quite as uh, well realised as, as an open world as, um, you know, perhaps a Red Dead Redemption. It doesn't really bear too much in common with a, a city-based open world, although there are, is a, um, some large city environments. Um, it, it it probably commits one sin that's really uh, kind of bad for me is um, every time you move through an area there's loads of NPCs and they're doing interesting things and it looks real and uh, you know the wind's blowing the trees and the, it, it, to, to look at I mean it's a stunning looking game at the best of the times but it feels alive to look at to kind of mm. exist in but the people they'll just be repeating they'll, you know they'll be gossiping ladies and they'll just literally repeat the same story over and over and over again forever or, or a guy will always have the same little dialogue loop, and that killed. That to me, it's just like that's why I could never get into the open worlds in Assassin's Creed because they 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 do that really badly, and that kind of kills. It kills that side of things for me a little bit. Um, it mm. kills that feeling, that sense of just being in a world and um, just enjoying the sense of discovery organically. So, because of that, instead of letting that get to me too much, and I don't want to dwell on it. Um, I, I've taken to just doing what I'm pretty sure the game really wants you to do is is picking up both uh, the main story quests and and uh, the sort of endless, seemingly endless um, side quests, uh, all of which, bar none uh, of what I've done um, in a very significant amount of time playing a game, have been uh, of a ridiculous quality. Um, mm. The story starts off with the classic kind of tutorial area back at... Um, like where the witch uh, lives and, 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 and trains with a, with an older witcher, uh, and then quickly you move out into the open world, and there's like it's kind of some smaller tutorial open world, and then the bigger open world, and then the game really starts. But even the smaller tutorial open world is has its own side quests, and there's like job boards that you can find in the little villages where you can pick up little uh, contracts to go and kill beasts or um, just other little missions and stuff like that. So I was doing the main story, and uh, you know the dialogue is extremely well written. Um, for, I was going to say for a game but it's just very very well written it's smart it has a it has a real economy of words it uses slang and colloquialism really well the acting is very good it doesn't feel the need to um, overexpose all its story elements it, it will use one sentence when other games would use three or four mm. really just uh, great stuff stuff that we've seen in the certainly in the previous games like this as well I'd say this is a, a level above that certainly in terms of the performances and the performance capture that they use for, for a lot of the cutscenes. But um, I went off to go and do a couple of side quests, and they were of a standard that uh, would be higher than, uh, in terms of story, not just story, in terms of gameplay as well, uh, higher than you'd find in main story missions in other good open-world RPGs. I mean, this is stuff, incidental stuff, really, that you could quite easily miss or never do. Um, I talked a bit before about Skyrim and how quests layer on top of each other and stuff like that, but this is that to another level. You can do something seemingly incidental or seemingly um, just a nothing, like you think it's just going to be a kind of fetch quest type thing, and it ends up unveiling a really interesting story, a really well-realized side story, nothing that necessarily pertains to the overall plot of the game, but just kind of... They're characters, and they might not even be characters that you see. They might be characters that are just written about, but they're interesting, and you want to find out about them, and you want to um, kind of understand what's happened. And it, it, while it deals in the supernatural, and it deals with the you know the fantastical, and sometimes the absurd, it's always very human. And that's um, probably one of the biggest compliments I can pay to the the way the game's written and the way the game's constructed, because everything feels like real people and issues that are actually interesting and. Um, uh, it's quite impressive how it manages to make everything so compelling. Uh, slightly of a slightly lower quality, I'd say, is the um, the sort of 
physical mechanics of the game. Um, combat is fine in parts, less so in others. Um, it's not dissimilar to The Witcher 2. It's probably slightly more accessible. You can lock onto a target, move around them. Uh, you tend to fight from distance and all your attacks jump in with a spinning move. Uh, it looks slightly strange. And you can parry and, and kind of dodge and stuff like that and use your, your the, the various magic that you have. But there's not a lot of sense of weight to your swords and uh, combat can be quite frustrating because um, you can sort of uh, be hit with it knowing that you couldn't dodge. or It's just, it's fine, but it's not great. And you feel that it could be great but even within the confines of the same game same systems just a few tweaks could have really elevated it uh, a few tweaks of the AI perhaps but it's fine it can be a little frustrating I can understand why some people have chosen to turn it down to the easier setting because they just want to enjoy uh, the world and enjoy the, the stories and enjoy the, the writing and not worry about getting killed over and over again in annoying fights yeah. um, I've, I've talked about some of the issues with the with the world itself, as amazing it is to look at, it doesn't feel alive in the same way that some other open worlds have managed to achieve. But it's still, it's still of a you know much higher quality than than most. And in terms of its scale, in terms of the way it looks, it's um, it's quite incredible. But um, yeah, what an amazing but amazing piece of work! A game where you feel like you can go anywhere, and that anything that you choose to do is going to be both of consequence from gameplay perspective. And in like, if you're going to go off and try and find some little question mark on your map, you know you're either going to end up with an interesting story thing to happen or an interesting piece of loot. Nothing ever feels like busy work. Nothing ever feels like that checklist you're ticking off like in a Ubisoft open world game, which has become really. Uh, kind of annoying i would say um i'm not a completist thankfully so it doesn't bother me as much as some people if, if you're the type of person needs 100 percent a game some of those other open world games must drive you mad this has a lot to do i mean you're, you're doing everything in this game i'm sure it'll be sort of 200 hours but um everything i've done so far feels it, it feels worth it and it feels um like it's of value but um yeah I, I can't remember i think i was doing a list of points there but i've kind of forgotten what i was talking about but uh, just a hell of a, a hell of a piece of work. Um, talked about labour of love before with a small game like Nero. This is a labour of love of many many people uh, in an incredibly talented, hardworking studio over in Poland, and um, just has production values of a game that it, you would tend to not associate with that part of the world. But you could say that about Dying Light as well earlier this year. So I think that mm-hmm. the scene over in Poland is um, is really quite impressive right now. But and, and this game has sold um, sold like gangbusters as well, which is great to hear. But yeah, yeah this I mean, it, it, it's a sheer it's an easy candidate for game of the year. But there's already been something else which I'm sure I, it cannot be toppled this year for me, and I'll talk about it soon. Hmm. Uh, are you going to finish it? Do you think? <laughs> I really, really think so. Yeah, I mean, the main quest that I'm on now is so good that um, the thought of not knowing what happens next, and that's rare, right? It's it's yeah. normally like you either want to complete it because you've given so much time to it and you just want to get through it, or it's fun to play. It, I want to know what happens next, and I think that, I mean, it's really rare, especially for a game that's not like a Walking Dead or, you know, that's not just a story game. I can think of Mass Effect. Mm. I can think of this. I can't think of many more that have, that's the reason I want to keep playing. Um, just, just constantly surprising and re- genuinely compelling um, and brilliant. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Some, some ropey stuff. Some occasionally questionable um, uh, male, female stuff. I'll just put it like that. I mean, it's, it's nothing, nothing bothersome or anything that would upset me. But you know, in a game this vast, you're going to have a couple of little moments where you're like, eh, it's probably not as good as the rest of it. But huh. yeah, overall. Um, amazing controls are a little bit shonky. I've got to talk about that horse controls and camera controls, but you get used to them. Uh, I mean, I never had any issues with the controls on the second one. Are they similar? Um, it's just it's quite twitchy, but I also came from one of the tightest games I've ever played, which I will talk oh, about yeah. in a minute. So it was a hard, it was hard to come from that. But uh, and also the other game that I'm playing at the moment is an incredibly tight game in Batman. So it, it does feel a little loose and uh, and dodgy compared to those, but. I think they've been refining it through patches because it doesn't seem to be as bad as it was when I first played it. Hmm. Have you not been... So, I mean, I suppose it speaks volumes that you haven't been tempted to just bash through the story. It feels like you'd almost be doing the game a disservice to, by doing that. Also, it, you you kind of need to do side quests because of the way the levelling works. You can't just go and like hack things up and level up. You can only really get experience by doing quests or side quests. 
and I was under leveled for for story quests for a while, so I had to go and do other stuff. But it felt like I was living the life of the Witcher, you know, a mercenary who is a monster hunter basically, and, uh, and only works for money, um, which is a great reason for doing side quests as well. A really simple and elegant reason for doing side quests. You always get paid, and that's your job. Mm. So yeah. you know, thankfully, those side quests always tend to be interesting as well. But from um, you know, why the hell do you do side quests in most games? Because because that's what you do, right? But here, it's just a very simple narrative explanation. But yes, um, even even if I didn't have to do the side quest in order to level up and have to do the main quests, I still think that um, after those first two side quests that I did just to test them out, I'd be like, I'm, I can't miss, I can't miss out on the content. You know, there's not yeah. been a duffer yet. The only reason I mentioned uh, mentioned that is because a few months ago they came out and said, didn't they? They said it's X hours long but if you want to complete the story you can just basically go straight through um, and complete it in 8 hours or 10 hours or whatever they said and I didn't know what, I mean that actually was probably longer ago than, I, than I'm than i remembering so mm. they might have changed their outlook and sort of made some of those things basically mandatory behind the scenes but yeah I mean it may be the case of there's like the, the story quests start to become multi-parted and you get experience for completing them all so you can probably over level yourself for the rest of it I think mm. there's just a part sort of uh, reasonably early on where I think it's probably the game just encouraging you to go hold on this isn't don't just rattle through this because you're going to miss all of this around it but um, yeah it's it's a vast vast game and a, and a truly incredible one it's been it's been a ridiculous run in the last few weeks yeah uh, no doubt well um, I, a friend has very kindly lent me his copy of Witcher and it's in the post as we speak so I'll be playing that I'll speak about it next week oh no <laughs> I won't um, <laughs> just have fear chill, fear chill down my spine. I'm yeah, like, no, I just thought, imagine, imagine <laughs> sweating trying to like trying to finish it uh, in time for the record. Yeah, no, thank fuck. Um, but do you want to do your? I mean, I suppose I could. Do, I, I don't even know what to say. My other my other game is Destiny. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't really even know what to say about it. Well, you might as well end on the other one just because it's newer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, have you played Destiny much? Um, I played. Yeah, I mean, I played um, a good chunk of House of Wolves. I've not played it for a few weeks. But uh, I'm not on on the wagon or off the wagon or whatever you want to call it quite as yeah. much as uh, you guys are. But um, yeah, I'm still, I still I kind of played it through to be honest. I never really stopped. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I don't know where to begin. I, I mean, I I remember when the game came out. I said that it confused me because I didn't really know what it was, and now I know exactly what it is, and I'm even more confused than I was then. Um, I've just I, I, I don't, I've just kind of decided that I don't want gaming to be like this. Mm. Um, I often feel like I don't know what Destiny wants from me, but really I do. What Destiny wants is more of my time. Um, I have felt obliged to play it almost every day for a month at least, maybe two months. Um, And while the game itself is brilliant, I don't want it delivered in this way. Um, I've started to really miss Battlefield because the only reason we kept returning to Battlefield was because it was fun. And Destiny's still fun. I mean, this is the... (laughs) I haven't felt addicted to something in this way before. I don't think. Yeah, you know, I've I've never played an MMO, and you know, I can't get any closure from it. I feel compelled to play it, even when I'm not really enjoying it. Mm. And I hate feeling like I need crucible marks and grinding away in the crucible, which is something I hate. I just, but I still feel compelled to do it. I'm doing it when I'm not enjoying it. But when I mean, when do, I mean, we've started basically six of us. We've started doing both of the raids once a week. Because they're so brilliant. Mm. You haven't done the second one. I haven't done the second one yet. They're still as a group to do it. Oh, God. It's, they're so brilliant. I mean, I hadn't done the Vault of Glass until a month or so ago, and it did not disappoint. Mm. Um, I mean, those two... I could do those over and over again all day. Um, I don't, I'm so confused because I love the game. I just... I hate this model. I think it's too persuasive. I, friends of mine regularly lose days to Destiny, and... I've been recently getting lost in a bubble a little bit too, and I, I, I don't know. It, it isn't, en- it isn't just entertainment anymore. It's a compulsion as well, and I think I'm getting to an age where I think that investing that amount of time in a video game is kind of worrying. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, it's, 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 it's really, it's really, and, and this, the way they handle some aspects of it, I hate. Like, uh, th- have you uh, encountered Thorn? Thorn is who's Thorn? A handgun. It's a handgun. Oh, oh no, but I, I actually bouncing. read an article about this. Yeah, I read. Oh, what does it say? Um, it's on Games Radar, written by an old friend of mine. Um, it's basically saying about how it's a nightmare, but also 
that people are going to have to adapt and that's the way these things always go but it's basically sort of 75 percent saying it's a nightmare but should we should it be nerfed or should the community just work out ways around it was... There aren't really ways around it, though. It's yeah. just an ex- an extraordinarily powerful handgun. Two shots to the head and you're dead. It, it depletes your health because you fire poison bullets or something. And we, ju- whenever we go in the Crucible, we will have games where the only gun you get killed by is that thorn because everybody uses it. And the way you unlock that gun is by doing this incredibly difficult exotic weapon bounty where you have to get 500... Uh, like damage points with purple void void damage, right? And the bounty every time you die or every time you get a kill uh, without void damage weapons, that your the, the number goes down. So you could literally be stuck doing that bounty forever because you get a couple of kills, it goes mm. up. You die a couple of times, it goes down. And I just think what you're rewarding the most skillful and the people who played it the most with the most overpowered handguard, it seems completely wrong. In order to get a gun that gives you an advantage, you have to already have an advantage over everybody else by playing the game a ridiculous amount and being insanely good at it. Um, and those bounties, there are a few of those and a few of those exotic weapon bounties where death resets your progress. And I just think, why would you have an, a gameplay system in your game that could literally leave someone stranded doing it forever? <laughs> I don't. This 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 is really it. Really confused me because I think it's kind of a masterpiece, Destiny. But I don't like. And, and you know, hearing them announce the 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 DLC is going to cost the same as the main game, and talking with my friends about it, and they're just like, "This is an outrage. It can't be allowed to happen." Are you still going to get it? One hundred percent. They're because because they're all hooked. Mm. Like they're going to. They're, you know, and it seems like it seems to me like Activision are well aware of this. And now this, they're, they're, they're pushing their luck because once people are really, really hooked in, you can sort of start taking the piss a little bit. And I, and I, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't know. It's, I, I'm so confused about this. I've probably made no sense, and I've contradicted myself a hundred times. I'm certain of it. But I'm going to step away from Destiny. Uh, I have to because it's just, it's. I, I don't, I don't know. I love it, but I, I just, I don't understand. Yeah, I've stepped away for the time being. I'll, I'll come back on probably when um, when Thingy comes out. It's difficult because I'm a bit under leveled compared to to the other people that I play with. Um, we're on different formats, hence we, that's why we don't play uh, on the same team. Mm. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, it's just like whenever I felt in that game that I was grinding, like truly grinding, doing stuff that I wasn't enjoying, just for the purpose of seeing a number go up, I, I stopped. I managed to get to level thirty quite efficiently, but I don't have much much gear which um is now kind of holding me back a little bit i'd say and uh, we spent a while one of the last things i did in the game was during the iron banner we spent some time playing that because the guy i was playing with wanted to get to, to rank five on that to be able to buy yeah, it's like. yeah to buy a thing if you don't play destiny it's like a thing you get to level up um and i was like i was playing it with him and it's it's not that much fun playing iron banner <laughs> because right. especially when you're quite under leveled and I knew I wasn't going to get to that level because I just wasn't going to put that sort of time or effort in. I, I, it just wasn't going to happen. And I was like, this is not really fun at all. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, and I was like, the thought of doing some of those strikes again that I've done that many times, and compared to people who really play Destiny, I've barely done them at all, but I've done them enough for me. It was enough to make me um, step back. So I definitely will come back in for Taken King, but I feel like I'll be a bit under level compared to everybody. But they have, it, it's you can level up so fast now. I I got a character up because uh, when my girlfriend got it, we st- I started another character, mm. uh, and we went through it together. And after we finished the campaign, I was twenty, and then I slung a couple of things earlier in my vault, um, and then I was basically twenty eight in one go. You can level up so fast. Right. I think they've they've changed it. It doesn't take anywhere near as as long as it once did. Yeah, I think with a bit of graft, I mean a little bit of graft, I could get uh, the level up, but I just didn't want to. There was I was like this is taking away from time playing. The Witcher, exactly. yeah, yeah, exactly. It, like there has been periods where I was like, well, I'd rather play Destiny. Like the end of last year, but I'd rather play pretty much the whole time Destiny than anything else that came out because I just yeah. didn't think anything was really of the high. You know, some of the games I was really looking forward to, like Far Cry Three, it was, it was good, but it wasn't. It just wasn't of that level. It wasn't of the level of the games that we've come on this podcast to, to talk yeah. about today, and I don't think anything else. Anything was at the end of last year, really. Yeah, the, well, I saw two games of last year with Destiny and um, and Titanfall, right? Titanfall, and Titanfall was yeah. March. Destiny yeah. was September. Um, but yeah, since since other stuff has come out, um, it's. It, but the thing is, I'm lucky in that I don't have the type of personality that gets that gets hooked on stuff. Really, I get obsessed with things that I'm into, but um, 
you know, I don't, I, I don't have a very addictive personality as a person, so I find it reasonably easy to just walk away yeah. from, from that game. And uh, so I'm kind of lucky in that respect because I understand people who do have a more addictive personality is, is definitely preying on those, you know, those uh, those character traits. Yeah, yeah, and that's what that, I think. The realization that I'm really, I, I'm. You know, waking up occasionally thinking, "Oh fuck, I've got to go and do some bounties before starting work and all that stuff." I'm just mm. like, I can't. And there's some, there was a the time last week. There are these new bounties where you um, have to go and kill X. You know, the the yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the, Means, the wolves yeah, that yeah. drop down from the sky. Yeah. And I was sitting there waiting for a ship to drop, and I was like, "What am I doing? Yeah. I am sitting here <laughs> waiting to kill a I thing so that. I can go." It's, and then there was I got another a, a bounty for something or other and mm. it was like go and kill so and so in public events and I went to this area and I sat there for 20 minutes and no public event happened I should have used one of those bloody uh, the app or yeah. whatever it is I didn't and so I sat and waited for 20 minutes in a game I just I don't know the game confused me I just I thought what do you want from me how, how much more time can I give me and I don't the, the, to, to, I don't want games to, to take this much time. I don't want them to be this open ended because then publishers start drip feeding you overpriced content, and I don't want to be. I don't want that to be a thing. I, but I'm completely hooked on it. It's horrendous. I don't know I, when you hear a developer talk about what they want, what, what they're trying to create, and what they, what they you know, what, what the game is. It's often inspiring, but I've heard people talk about Destiny, and it sounds like the plans of a Bond villain. I'm just like, what, what, what do you? What, what is your ideal plan that the entire population of the world is stuck indoors, to, just waiting for the downloadable content? I don't know. I, I, I wish I've had some wonderful times playing Destiny. Like I said, my girlfriend's picked it up, and we've had some. Yeah. She's part of our strike team and stuff, and that's been great. I just, I, I, I I'm, I'm confused. I'm still confused. Mm. That's it. I, I mean, I, I, I want to play that second raid. I'd happily play the first one again. I've done it one and a half times. Um, I'd happily play that probably two or three more times, in fact, and do that second raid as many times as that. Because, I mean, that, that, that first time through that raid, uh, we, we only got halfway through, but um, it was amazing when we were discovering yeah. it for ourselves. Second time I played it was with people that knew what they were doing. That was still amazing, but it wasn't quite as um, revelatory. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it's tough. I'll be there. It, it, it's not going anywhere, but um, I've had other stuff to do in the meantime. So mm. that's the, sec- the second raid is every bit as good, I think. Right. Well, um, yeah, no, I definitely want to play that. But um, but you've got no desire to kill Dick Cheney again? That's the guy, the guy on the Summoning moon, right? Bits. Yeah, I mean, no, the thought, of doing that for, the thought of doing that strike again makes me feel sick, but that's because I think <laughs> if you were to do a graph of all the strikes that I've played, you know, it would be like... This one 10 times, this one 12 times, this one 15 times. And that one, I swear, would be like 37 times. Yeah. I don't know why. I've done that one so many times. But, yeah, this just it's so boring. Oh, my God, it's yeah. so boring, that guy at the end. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, I don't want to do that again. Right. Yeah. Well, um, okay, then. So uh, my number one, I guess you could call it, or the game yeah. that, uh, that I was really most interested in talking about, um, it's Bloodborne um, mm. on PlayStation 4. The game's been out about three months now. Um, and it's kind of going to be difficult for me to talk about this in, in some respects because so much has been written, less so about this game, but uh, you know, so much has been written and said about the Souls series, which, of course, this is a, a major part of. And this is my first proper um, experience with one of these games. Now, I'd played a bit of Demon Souls when that first came out. I played a decent chunk of the first Dark Souls Um in terms of hours, anyway, not I didn't get massively far uh, before Bloodborne came out. Both when Dark Souls first came out, and then later again. So I certainly had enough experience with that, that, that these games and kind of understood what they were to an extent. Mm. But uh, this is the one that um, that you know captured captivated me and kind of captured my attention in a, in a completely different way to any of the others. Um, yeah, it's uh, I I would. I was thinking about what my all-time favourite video games are. Um, truly, truly all-time favourite video games, and we did it as our, you know, our final show and mm. Street Fighter Two, which is kind of a different thing, and then, you know, Super Mario World, which I've been replaying with my boy. It's been an amazing experience. Um, this is this is up there with them. We've talked about many, many great video games over 140 plus episodes of this show, but um, if I played one better than Bloodborne, I'd be uh, I'd be hard pressed to, to to think what it is and. 
do. It was, it's like, I was like, damn, this really feels like I need, after I finished it and started reading the stuff about it, which is mind blowing, but I'll talk about that in a minute. I felt it's like, this is like the first time since we finished the show that I actually felt um, that it was a bit of a shame that we didn't have a, a, a show so I could talk about this game. But it's mm. kind of hard for me to talk about it because I don't want to like wax lyrical about stuff that people already know um, about the Souls game. So what can I say about Bloodborne? Okay, well, it's. <laughs> Hmm. Right, let me think of the best way. Of... <laughs> this is tough for me. All right, I'll just go talk about what the game is, and hopefully it'll flow from there. So, um, you know, mechanically, it's it's similar to the Souls games in terms of it's it's on the surface a very difficult uh, action game, action RPG, but with a heavy emphasis on action. Um, in in Bloodborne, you play as a hunter in the world of Yarnum, a city, in fact, called Yarnum, which has been. Um, sort of overtaken by some sort of plague that you don't really know what it is. Uh, The game starts off very unusually, very, you know, no explanation about what's going on. You're having some sort of weird blood transfusion. Um, For for the uh, first few hours or or basically almost like a large chunk of your first playthrough, none of this stuff massively matters unless you're an incredible person at paying attention to every single word and every single syllable of every single word that's said or, or that you read throughout the game, which um, aren't, isn't even that many. So the best thing to think about is like the first sort of five to ten hours of the game is is learning a new combat system and a very, very um, demanding combat system. I'd say, I always said that it annoys me when people say these games aren't hard. They absolutely are hard, but I think um, perhaps a better word to, de- to describe them is demanding. So after having now finally finished one, but the first 10 hours uh, of Bloodborne, or however long it takes you to get to and, far, and past the first boss, I think it took me about eight hours, are very, very hard indeed. Because not only are you learning a, a combat game where one or two, well, two hits from the enemies, of which there are many, um, can kill you, uh, you're also learning one where if you've played the previous Souls games and you can have a big shield in front of you, you can no longer do that. So um, you're basically chucked into this dark city with all these people that look like from Resident Evil 4 patrolling the streets. And they can fuck you up quite quickly. And you basically have to unlearn everything that you've learned in games over your lifetime and and kind of relearn it. But as you do relearn it, you realise that not only is it not as... um, not as unpleasantly difficult as you as it could be it's not like a mega man or something like that it's also like you've learned bad habits over the years of especially in the last 10 years of games kind of holding your hand a little bit more than um, perhaps they should uh, and it's really quite satisfying to to just accept this game on its own terms instead of trying to play it as if you were playing a different game but having said that once you get to the first boss which is um really impressive uh, giant beast and that's where I suddenly realised what the game's combat was and what the game could be after that first boss I mean, which took me maybe 10 goes I would say you know beating that thing was a rush uh, of the likes of which I can't ever remember having from video games certainly not since I was young uh, and after that I was completely hooked so what followed was another 30 plus hours of um, some of the most sort of awe inspiring design architecture artistry um just ideas just you know unbelievable imagery and and extremely tight uh, combat gameplay that um just it's constantly demanding of you as a player to give you you have to give everything that you have just like when you're playing a halo or even a destiny at a high level you 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 can't shy away or or play lazily or take things for granted you have to be 100% 100% on your game at all times and if you if you are that the game will reward you in spades and I think that's from a gameplay point of view the, probably the best way that I can describe it without going over old ground that other people have described um, far better than me uh, about the other Souls games uh, it's you know a hack and slash game fundamentally you also have a gun which isn't really a gun it's actually a tool for parrying um, once you get used to that, it's very satisfying to walk up to an enemy, wait for it to hit you, shoot it at the last second, and then tear out its heart with uh, one button press. It makes you feel um, it makes you feel extremely overpowered, and the game is typically making you feel quite underpowered. Mm. But the the thing that, that was constantly hooking me into Bloodborne was just not knowing where I was going next. Um, the game starts out in this kind of Victorian esque city uh, and moves to uh, to some very unusual places indeed, but constantly loops back round onto itself in a way that's just it's so mind-blowing that my brain literally couldn't 
possibly think of how it was made. I don't even know how to make a video game at the best times. I couldn't make Pong. So how this was made uh, and constructed is just it's the mind of a genius. There's no two ways about it. The the man Miyazaki, who is the um, the guy behind Demon Souls, the first Dark Souls, and now this. Uh, and Dark Souls 3 going forward is there's no doubt in my mind that the man is a genius um, yeah the level design really is um, it, it's, it's just astonishing really I can't really fathom how how anybody could uh, construct anything this impressive but um, yeah overall it's just it was an astonishing experience that, that, that really challenged me in, in so many different ways and it was only I got very fascinated by um, like watching a couple of YouTube videos on the, the the basis of the story of this game, which is difficult to very difficult to pick up on as you're playing through. But you get sort of tidbits of the the, the kind of grander uh, stuff that it's aiming for. And um, when I got to the end, I was just utterly fascinated by it, by what had been presented to me. And you can there's a, a Google Doc out there which uh, has been pieced together by an incredible person and a very skilled writer actually. That um, it's like I think it's like ninety pages long, ridiculously, sort of explaining all the story of this game, everything that they've pieced together, and some theories about it as well. And like, you, I mean, most of it is is something you can't even argue with. It's it's pretty much like it has to be taken as fact because it's just it's based on like literal dialogue that happens in the game and things that you find. A lot of the game's story is actually told through um, item descriptions, which is the same as the other games. Something you'd never really think of, but these brief, well written, very kind of sometimes wittily written um, item descriptions. A lot of the words have double meanings and stuff. It's amazing that it's it's a Japanese Japanese game because the the command of English is ridiculous, mm. but um, it's it, it's an astonishing <laughs> it's an astonishing piece of um, of narrative uh, and of story of storytelling uh, the the sort of ambition and, and scale of which is is like nothing I've experienced almost in anything. Um, it has the kind of depth of a book, a great book, but the um, but it's never afraid of being a game at any point and uh, and sort of existing and and playing around with with puns around but not direct I mean it's kind of difficult to describe people who who know about these games I'm sure will understand what I'm trying to to get at but I was just absolutely blown away by what I was reading it's like you know from what I understand a, lar- a large part of what the game is 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 kind of Lovecraftian uh, I I would you know I didn't do English A level even though you know I've been a writer for how many years I don't know that much about writers and fiction so I wouldn't pretend that I do but um, some of the tropes of his work is sort of central to this but uh, it's kind of beyond that it's this it's sort of almost a, a grander story about um, sort of about uh, addiction and um, even just like relationships and, and, and birth and death and it's, it's honestly mate, I couldn't believe it when I was reading this that this was in a video game and it had been you could play through this game and not even pick up on a minute of this, and then you read it all this back. And this isn't just some guy theorizing. Oh, I think it's like this. It's all in there. It's literally word for word pulled out, and then you just read it on the page, and they're like, "Holy shit! I can't believe that they've constructed this world that goes back generations, and all these characters." It's 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 fucking unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. Um, it's still kind of astonishing just to think about it now. When I read all that and then started to go back through the game again, and it's like when you see Fight Club for the second time, and it's all there in front of you being spelled out and it's all there again when you when you kind of understand what the game is about it's all there every single inch of it you you understand every single detail of this game from the re- way like to the like the health like when you get hit you lose some health right and then you can regain some of that health by attacking the things that's explained now literally every it's it's ridiculous i cannot believe it um uh, just uh, it, it, i am almost at a loss of words for um uh, for, for how impressive this this is as a video game, it's, it's encouraged me to go back to the other ones. I've been back to Demons a bit. It's uh, it's kind of old now. Um, it's still very impressive, and uh, and I've been trying to do Dark Souls again, which is um, clearly excellent and by all accounts gets better and better and better. But that game revels in fucking you over in a way that Bloodborne doesn't really. It doesn't seem to feel necessarily. It it trolls you sometimes, and it's certainly. You know, you can get stitched up by by the enemies and how difficult it can be. But you know, Dark Souls is the type of game that'll just go, "Here's a bridge," and then halfway through it, just goes, "Ah, the bridge collapsed." And then people will go, "Yeah, but if you looked here, there was like a rivet loose, so you could have seen that before it happened." But like, realistically, the idea was that you just got fucked over. Bloodborne doesn't really feel the need to do that, and I think that's actually to the game's benefit. Um, I think it, it it ends up being feeling more 
almost more confident in what it is trying to deliver instead of just uh, just playing with uh, the idea of trolling the player. But I, I'm just to have come to a game like this, just wanting to try it, just on the off chance that I liked it, and to to come away with that being how I feel about it at the end was uh, was a real surprise. I, I'd be amazed if I play a game this year that could possibly topple it for game of the year. And you know, The Witcher three and from what I played of Batman, they're incredible video games. But this is, um, yeah, probably the most Stone Cold ten out of ten I've uh, I've played since um, since uh, since Light Night Two, I'd say, which I think was when my my other two favourite games of all time came out. And ridiculously, to tie it back into all of that, um, one of the games I probably compare Bloodborne to most weirdly is Super Mario World, a game that um, there must be people have written about the the. Uh, the comparisons or whether that's influence or something like that on his games because the way the world is constructed in Super Mario World is ridiculous is that is to say um, the way the secrets are laid out the way even the the kind of repetition and learning through repetition and stuff it's it, having replayed that recently um, even stuff like the Forest of Illusions I mean it's a weird comparison because it's so they're, they're so dissimilar in so many ways but in so many ways it, it is it, it's this kind of weird approximation of that that type of game design. Um, uh, it's just, what can I say? I just make noises, really. That's about it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just fucking hell. Unbelievable piece of work. Just kind of re reignited my my passion for the medium and made me realise what is possible. And it doesn't just have to be, you know, interesting curio indie games that that are kind of pushing the medium and trying to do interesting things. It's game a game with this much polish and money behind it, and also this much um, gameplay. In it for for one of a a better turn of phrase you know this is a this is a game from you know first and foremost that's all about systems and and mechanics and you know the tightest possible way you know play um, and is never afraid to be that which is uh, yeah stuff that people have been saying about these games for years but this is the one for me. How long did it take you to finish it? Forty two hours, which isn't that long, really. No, it's not. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I put four hours into it, mm. um, and I, I think I think two things happened. One was that I, I think I over, I started to overthink things, and I started to find things intimidating when it. I think it's a lot more simple than I than I realised. Yeah. Um, I started uh, assuming that this was possibly this, and then I started to get uh, to get worried. But also, and this is another reason I hate Destiny, is that I felt I got sort of antsy whenever mm. I'd know that friends of mine were on Destiny, so I'd have to jump to Xbox and go on that. So I bailed on it after four hours, but I will, I'm going to have to find time to play. Yeah, well, we talked about it on um, on text, didn't we? I think the best thing to do is because I think you just need someone to just help you through that first bit just so you understand what's going on and why yeah. it works the way it does. And once you do, um, you'll be fine. From there, because honestly, like after that first boss, there was no, not a moment again where I didn't feel like I was kind of in control. Um, it was always hard, and you knew things were going to be difficult, but I knew what I was doing and why I was doing it pretty much the whole time. Certainly in terms of the, the physicality of the game, not necessarily in terms of the story. But that mm. That's not really what we're talking about. But I yeah. think yeah, once if I could just sit down with you, while we do it on share play and get you to that boss and get you fighting that boss. Because once you're there, and the run to get there from the the little bonfire equivalent, the lamp is like. To like 15 seconds so it's not mm. difficult at all you can just basically sprint back to it and then it's like a question of it's just gameplay then can you beat this boss with with you know the weapons that you have but I might watch you play and go fuck there's all this stuff that you've missed because it doesn't teach you in the way that t- games traditionally do that um, you know and then I tell you three things and suddenly like oh fuck and you can just rattle through that first bit that you might have never even known was in the game so yeah, we will. Don't, we we have to do it because, I mean, of all the games that I've played, I know you'd love this fucking game. I talked to, I told you about this. I mean, like the reason I love this game really, well, I talked about all the story and all that sort of stuff. But the reason I was loving the game all the way through is just like the atmosphere, the ideas, and the fucking gameplay, the combat, which you know is up there with any of the the best action games I've played. It's different. Mm-hmm. It doesn't play like a DMC or a, a Bayonetta or, or you know something like that, but. Yeah, it's um, amazing, amazing game. Yeah, well, I, will, I, will, I think my problem was that I, another problem was that I just I, I was walking a lot and seeing new areas and just thinking, am I supposed to be here? I don't know whether I've walked into something that I'm supposed to do at a different time. I don't know whether I'm supposed to keep going this path. I'm, I felt like it was a, a massive open area and I wasn't finding anything. Uh, yeah, it's, it, that, that first area is basically like 
well, you're going to need to understand all of this in order to do the rest of the game. But once you do, it will all seem very unintimidating. It was, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a fuck you, to be honest, that first the first area. But I think that seems to be traditional. Whether or not, I couldn't, I, you think, could it be more streamlined and, and ease you in differently? But I wouldn't want it to change because I just think that it needs to be like that in order to, to be as successful as it ends up being later on. But, um, but also, it, you know, people help each other through these games. That's how they work. Mm. So, uh, you know, I watch some like beginner's guides and stuff to help me. So, yeah, but I don't want to be one of those Dark Souls people now. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think that's that's in any danger of happening. No, but fucking hell, this is this. I, I'm pretty sure this will always be the one of all of them. Is I, I intend to play them all now. Um, Even Demon Souls. That sitting on the PS3 in the lounge where we play. Um, like media files and DVDs and stuff so it's just there whenever I it's the only games machine I have in the, the living room so yeah or we'll just play a bit every now and then um, it might, even if it takes me like five years whatever it's just going to sit there that machine but um, mm. yeah as much as I, I Dark Souls I went back to it and it just it fucked me off a lot mm. I started it again and yeah I'll, I'll get through it but it kind of just made me want to play Bloodborne <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Um, all right, well, I think that's us done then, isn't it? I guess it is. It took a little longer than I thought. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry isn't for that, a bit rusty, Wasn't that, always, wasn't that <laughs> always the case? Very, though? very much so. Very much so. But yeah, it was fun, uh, to, fun to do it. Sure, yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Mm. Um, I mean, there's nothing really on the YouTube channel these days. There will be a, vi- a wee video going up at some point, um, and there will be a couple of videos going up here and there. So, uh, yeah, subscribe to us on YouTube, Chet and John. Um, there's a podcast feed that tells you when and if this happens again, uh, and that's uh, pretty much it. But, yeah, um, thank you. Actually, hold on. I've just remembered something. I've just remembered something I've got to bring up with you very quickly. Oh, yeah. um, in Arkham Knight, um, have you done any of the sequences where you're... Uh, rewinding time to try and find clues no you haven't done that okay there's a few of them and they are brilliant there's some of the best parts of the game because you're analysing crime scenes and trying to find clues and you really feel like a detective Mm. and they they look great they feel great I mean those are highlights Um, I was trying to think when I was doing them the last time I, I don't think anything like that was in Arkham City I think the only other time I've done something like that, the two times, was one was in Remember Me, um, and I thought that was, you know, that was a revolutionary gameplay system. That was the first time I'd seen it, I thought it was terrific. And the only other time that I've seen it was in Arkham Origins, mm. where you remember you were in that apartment in the front of the building. Yeah, I think you, you do got, it one or two times in that game, yeah. Yeah, did you? Do, but you didn't do it in Arkham City, did you? No, they're not in Arkham City, no. See, that's what it's so strange that they've uh, Rocksteady have taken a step away. You know, have sort of basically disavowed all knowledge of Arkham Origins, when one of the best gameplay systems in Arkham Knight was sort of pinched. I suppose you don't really know how it happened. They, I mean, the, Arkham Knight has been in development for so long that that might have been stolen in the first place. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, it's just something. Something I, I thought I thought it was a bit strange. But those those bits are fantastic. Yeah, I'll, I'll look forward to those. Hmm. I look forward to uh, playing okay. the game. Yeah, sorry. There's probably more I can talk about Batman because we kind of rushed through it, but never mind. Yes, and sorry if I rambled over any of that stuff. I haven't done this for a while, so... Uh, likewise. I'm sure it was fine. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. We'll be back one day, probably. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe yeah. not. Goodbye.
shall not abandon the dream. No one can catch us. No one can stop us now.